Hi, everybody. Today we are talking about disc herniations. A lot of times on the boards, this might pop up as an HNP, which is herniated nucleus pulposus. If that is what is happening, that means the same thing. There is a disc herniation at some point in the spine. Most disc herniations are going to be happening in the lumbar spine around like L4, L5, L5, S1 kind of level, but you can have a herniated disc in your cervical spine as well. Honestly, really anywhere, but it's more common in the lumbar spine, but let's kind of get into it. So anatomy. So we have the intervertebral disc because that's what's the annulus fibrosis and nucleus pulposus and all that's breaking out of. So if we look at this picture down here, I think this picture is a little bit better. We can see that we have our intervertebral disc. So we have this big disc. The annulus fibrosis is that fibrous kind of connective tissue that surrounds the middle of the nucleus pulposus, and that is the um, like protective layer of the the disc itself to provide to provide extra support to it. And so, what is happening is the nucleus pulposus that is that kind of gelatinous kind of um, center of the intervertebral disc. And what can happen is that can end up popping out. So this picture on the bottom left corner of the nucleus pulposus popping out through the annulus fibrosis. So that means that the annulus fibrosis was either weakened or damaged in some way, causing compression of like a nerve root or something like that. So we can see that we have our intervertebral disc. We have our annulus fibrosis, which is that fibrous connective tissue covering around the nucleus pulposus. And then we also have our vertebral bodies, which tend to sometimes, that's the bone, that tends to sometimes compress the disc itself which could cause a herniation in the disc. So let's kind of get into the etiology of this because that will make it make a lot more sense. So the etiology of having a disc herniation is, this is the main one. This is what the boards is probably going to use. This is what you're gonna see in the clinic. This is the gold standard. This is with bending forward and twisting. So it could be a combo of both, it could be one or the other, but usually that forward and then twist ends up being the reason why we see a disc herniation, which makes sense because then we see that most of our disc herniations will happen posterior laterally. So what that means, it's coming out the back and kind of out the side. So we can see here with this vertebral body, and this intervertebral disc that the disc where the herniated is herniated right here. And this is where the nucleus pulposus is jetting out and compressing that nerve root. So we can see that that's posterior towards the back and laterally. So it's at that angle. And that's because if we think of here, let me stop sharing my screen for a hot second. Because if we think of how the disc is, and if this is our vertebral bodies, okay? So my thumbs are the back end of it. If we're compressing our disc and we're bending forward, we can see our disc. The only place for our disc to go is out the back. So that is why it's called a posterior lateral kind of herniation when it comes to the disc. So continuing on, this is going to be caused by poor lifting mechanics. That's one of the more common reasons we're going to see, especially in the clinic, due to or we or due to a weakened annulus fibrosis. So what it could be is just repetitive, repetitive, repetitive re weakening of the annulus fibrosis. That's the connective tissue around, which could eventually cause a simple activity such as reaching down to pick up something off the floor that could cause them to actually herniate a disc because their annulus fibrosis is so weak. So poor lifting mechanics can definitely weaken it. And you could see this with somebody picking up a very heavy object, like a heavy box, maybe a heavy deadlift or something like that, that would cause the weakening of the fibrosis as well. Or even that could be just traumatic enough to cause the disc herniation itself. So Another example of this could be you end up doing a heavy deadlift session, you're feeling great and everything, and then you go home and you try to plug your phone charger into the wall by bending over, you're not thinking about it, and all of a sudden you have numbness and tingling all the way down your right leg. That's what happened to me. So don't do that. So you can see how I might have weakened it, but then it was fine, but then I did something stupid, like just lean down and boom, hit it. That that's what causes it. So it's that bending forward and twisting. So you girls got problems with this as well. But most disc herniations, as I said before, happen at the L4, L5 level or the L5, S1 level. So that's very, very low down on the spinal cord, uh, spinal cord, spinal column. 
And that is why we see a lot of these numbness and tingling symptoms happening down the legs. And then people will feel it down into their feet as well, because that L5 S1 sort of level that goes all the way down into like the dorsum of your foot and even into like the posterior aspect of your calf and down into the plantar surface of your foot. So that's why people might see numbness and tingling all the way down. So speaking of that, what does it look like? Well, in this PowerPoint here, we have possible radicular symptoms if it's compressing a nerve root. So that's where you'll see the numbness and tingling and weakness on that specific side. Now, usually this is unilaterally because if we look at how the um, herniated disc kind of pops out, we can see it's usually popping out posterior laterally. So it's usually only affecting one side. So let's say you bend down, you twist, to the one side and you'll just feel it down like the opposite leg. That's just because of the mechanism of action of this injury. So that's why we would see that numbness, tingling, weakness, specifically unilaterally. Now, sometimes because an annulus fibrosis has been so weakened, we might end up seeing it on both sides just due to the fact that it's so weak, it ends up herniating out the other side as well. But the main thing I want you guys to know when it comes to a disc herniation is that you will have pain with flexion specifically. So pain is worse with activities such as sitting, bending forward over, so me plugging my phone charger into the wall, um, and any sort of increases in intra-abdominal pressure. So if they already have a herniation of their disc, if we're increasing the intra-abdominal pressure, that is going to cause the uh, herniation to pop out even more. So something like coughing or sneezing could cause them to have extra pain. So I don't know if you ever had a patient who's had a herniated disc who like literally like coughs or sneezes. They're literally like, ow, that really, really hurt. I can feel that zing down my leg. That's because that increase in intra-abdominal pressure is pushing the herniation out even more. So these patients don't like to sit down for a long time and they don't like to bend over towards touching their toes or something like that. That's gonna increase their symptoms. So flexion, herniated disc, bad. When it comes to um, how we would be able to tell what, like if it's actually a herniated disc or some other problem when it comes to like neurological issues, we would use an MRI to confirm this. So I'm sure a lot of people have noticed that when it comes to herniated disc or anything in the spinal cord, when it comes to making sure that the neurological symptoms, seeing where they're coming from, where are the radicular symptoms coming from, it's an MRI. And usually in the MRI, you can see that there's a bulging disc or herniation at some point along this, uh, along the um, spinal column. So usually, as I said before, most disc herniations are happening at that L4, L5, L5S1 level. So that's where we will see these. So how are we treating a patient who has a herniated disc? So this isn't mentioned too much in a lot of the study material that a lot of students use to study from, but the boards likes to use this as its big example. And this is kind of what we use in the clinic as well. But with a patient who has a herniated disc, we're going to have an extension bias with this patient. Now it might not be that much of an extension bias, it might not be any at all. They might just really like a neutral spine, but a lot of these patients are going to like being in a prone position just lying down prone, prone press, up, pr prone press ups. Wow. What a tongue twister with that one. Um, just like doing that, like half little push up, keeping your hips on the table. And that is because this specific exercise, that prone press up can actually help to push that disc back into place. So as I said before here, let me stop sharing my screen real quick. So this said before, if you have this out the back, the mechanism of injury was we bent forward and it pushed the disc out the back. If we want to get it to squish back in, we're gonna squish it back. So let's say there's like a little bit coming out here. We're gonna squish it back in kind of thing. Um, and they like to use the jelly donut as the example to explain how this exactly works when it comes to seeing how the disc can now, it's popped out and we bend backwards as an extension and we squish it back in. That's kind of what's going on when it comes to using the extension bias to help get everything back in there. So that works well with acute disc herniations, not so much with the chronic ones. Bird dogs as well, that puts you into extension. That also works on a lot of lumbar stabilization, which is something we love when it comes to these patients. Bridges also put the spine in a bit of extension. And this is a regular, just lift the hips up bridge, not an articulated bridge where you go into a posterior pelvic tilt first. Nope, nope, nope. We're just talking a regular, lift the hips up. Um, any sort of hip extension exercises as well, maybe like prone hip extension, or even like standing hip extension, those all are extension biases that'll help squish the disc back into place. So we love that. We want that for our patients. Modalities for pain management. So maybe this patient just wants to lay on their stomach with a hot pack on their back and they're like, this is awesome. That's what my patient wanted yesterday. She was just like, give me the hot pack on my stomach. 
90% of her pain was gone. We use that for pain management, e-stim, great thing, like IFC, stuff like that. Just anything to just calm everything down, decrease the pain so that we can actually do something with these patients. Lumbar stabilization exercises. So this is like the most important thing. So, you know, like the TA bracing, working on like TA activation with like, like any sort of um, like the bird dogs as I was using for an example earlier, just anything where we're working on keeping the core nice and tight, the core is nice and contracted, we're keeping everything in place because the more stabilized our spine is using all the muscles in our deep core muscles, the less likely they're going to have another episode like this. So essentially it's like cognitive training to make sure that we're not having any more like bulging happening at any level in the spinal column to avoid this happening again. Now I have this in bold because I would say this is probably one of the most important things when it comes to having a patient who has a disc herniation and also the boards wants you to hone in on this as well. I would, it, the most important thing when it comes to something like this is instruction on proper lifting mechanics and just general like patient education on making sure that they know how to properly pick things up, keeping that core nice and activated, TA activation, bracing and everything to avoid having this happen again in the future. Because remember, most of these are a bend and twist kind of thing, which are two things that we don't wanna do with proper ergonomics when it comes to like picking up a heavy box or something like that. So educate, 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 train them on lifting mechanics, use it with just their squatting down, standing back up, watching to see if their spine is collapsing over, if they have kind of like that butt wink and they're just like rounding their spine at the bottom, making sure they're keeping everything nice and neutral where it's supposed to be, nice and braced, proper lifting mechanics, especially for our patients who might come, be coming in with some sort of like work comp injury or something like that, where they need to go back to a job to be able to support themselves that requires them to pick up boxes, proper lifting mechanics. And then these patients might have a cortisone injection and just being aware that if a patient does have a cortisone injection, that there is no therapy for at least like 24 hours after they get that. Some surgeons have 48 hours. And this is just because the ligaments and surrounding tissues and everything become very lax. So if we are to work that out while they have the cortisone injection, we could potentially damage the tissue even further because essentially it's a band-aid. They're not feeling any pain which means that we could actually hurt it more. So be careful with that. So key words when it comes to a herniated disc. Prone, great. If they're liking prone, if prone is good, they might have had a disc herniation, but prone and extension bias, those are big. Pain with flexion is a good indication that this could be a herniation or something along those lines, just because that's the mechanism of injury. If we're putting them in the same position where they got hurt, they're not going to like that. Um, injured with bending and twisting. So remember, that's what the posterior lateral disc herniation, the bend and twist, because as we bend and twist, that's where it's going to pop out. So it's going to pop out to the back and then the side. And then remember, that's why we might have unilateral symptoms. Any sort of lifting injury, generally a lot of lifting <laughs> injuries end up being like a, either a disc herniation or a muscle strain. It's one of the two when it comes to that. You just have to use the other context clues of these other keywords to kind of distinguish, okay, is this a muscle strain or is this a disc herniation? Remember, Remember, with muscle strains, you're not going to have those neurological symptoms. If it's some neurological symptoms, that is going to be indicative of a disc herniation. And so that's why if you see ridiculous symptoms, we're thinking disc herniation. So guys, ready for the sample question? Alrighty. A physical therapist assistant is treating a workers' compensation patient who experienced an injury when lifting a heavy box and twisting. The patient reports pain is worse when bending over and demonstrates poor lifting mechanics. The patient is still working currently. What intervention is the most important to perform with this patient? One, soft tissue massage to lumbar musculature. Two, education on transverse abdominus awareness and proper lifting mechanics. Three, prone press ups or four, lumbar traction in supine. So I'll give you guys a second to think about this answer. All right, guys, so the answer is number two, education on TA awareness and proper lifting mechanics. So remember, as I said before, this is the number one thing we do with our patients. Make sure this doesn't happen again and that we know how to brace our core. So if we are doing this movement again, we're not having the same thing happen and it's Groundhog Day where we're back in the clinic again with an even worse disc herniation that would need surgery. So number one is incorrect because soft tissue massage, I guess that would 
probably help with them, but we can see that this patient was injured with the lifting, the bending and twisting. And then also it's worse with the bending over and everything like that. So we're like, okay, maybe this might help them if it's a muscle strain or something like that. But just looking at the mechanism of injury, we're thinking it's probably a disc herniation. Um, number two is the correct answer. Three prone press ups. Now this would be an intervention you definitely would want to do with this patient who ends up um, having a disc herniation just because it's acute. We realize it just happened. That might help get it back into place, but it's not as good. This is the most correct wrong answer. So it's not as good as number two, which is the education on awareness and proper lifting mechanics, because that will prevent the, them from coming back as a patient. Number three is the band-aid. Number two is the, I've taught the man to fish kind of thing. And you know, that like analogy with the fish. Um, so no, that's why number two is the more correct answer. And then lumbar traction and supine. Remember with disc herniations, they prefer prone. So if we're tractioning them in supine, that's probably going to aggravate their symptoms. Supine lumbar traction would be appropriate for like spinal stenosis. It would not be appropriate for a patient who has a disc herniation. So essentially number four is like definitely wrong. Number one, maybe that would be good. Number three, we probably definitely want to do this with this patient, but our number one thing that we want to do with this patient is to avoid this problem happening again. Because remember a lot of times when it comes to the boards, patient education ends up being the correct answer just because we want to make sure that our patients are aware because first and foremost, we are teachers to our patients. We teach them exercises. We teach them how to take care of themselves. We teach them so many different things. We have many roles as PTAs. So I hope that this was helpful in explaining a little bit about disc herniations, and I will see you guys in the next one. Take care.